Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Good afternoon. We're going to be using microphones uh, tonight, today, because we are live streaming. So we want to make sure that all those who are, um, who are at home are able to uh, hear what's going on. So even though uh, we, you might hear too much of us, let us know and we'll turn the volume down a little bit. Um, played golf today with our speaker. Um, he needed me on one hole, and I came through. Um, so uh, we're victorious, and uh, Bob Stapleton is going to present the award to us, uh, and then he's going to introduce Don. Uh, we're in for a real treat. We're excited about this, and welcome to the Chapel Talk this year. So Bob Stapleton. So about nine months ago in June, I played golf with Don at Catanza. And I'm guilty of asking all my golfing buddies who I've met before, you know, basically where you go to college and what sports did you play? And I learned he went to MIT and played golf. And I said, turns out he's a pretty good golfer. So three months later, he gave a presentation at Catanza, basically on high tides and red tides and green tides, which we thought was pretty interested, interesting. And my friend, Per Lalsberg at Jupiter Island invited him to come down and speak. And I said, well, if you're gonna do it, come to Jupiter come to Lost Tree, so we're lucky to have him here. And I asked uh, Don if he'd tell us a little bit about the Woods Hole Institution before uh, we start his formal presentation. Thank you, Don, for being here. I will. Thank you very much, Bob's, the two of you. Uh, I guess the, the first thing before we go into the details of this talk, let's talk a little bit about Woods Hole. Uh, many of you may not even know what it is. Uh, it's up in Massachusetts near Cape Cod, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It's the, I'm not biased, I think most people would agree, it's, it's the world's premier research institution for the ocean. Um, private, independent, non-governmental, non it's, it's, it's just a research institution. And we have more than 1,000 employees. We have about 100 scientists like me that, that are largely experts in all these different areas of the ocean, whether it's what's going on at the very bottom or what's going up in the surface, like I often work on. And uh, it's just an incredible place. If you're ever up at Woods Hole, stop by, visit. We've got an information center. It's, it's a wonderful place, potentially, to, to get engaged with because as it says here, it's our ocean, our planet, our future. 70% of the world's surface is ocean. You'll hear about all of the, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about warming. 80% of the heat we pump into the atmosphere or that enters the atmosphere ends up in the ocean. We're trying to feed all these new people. We're gonna have 10 billion people in the world at some point. How are you gonna feed them? A lot of that will come from the ocean. So we're all very busy. There's a lot going on uh, in all of our lives. So. But what I'm gonna talk about, back to these, this, this talk, I could talk to you for easily, hours and hours, all about red tides and brown tides and green tides and seaweeds and all of these kind of things. And I'll talk for half this talk about that. But there's also, I'm just like you, I'm a resident of a coastal community, I'm a golfer, and I'm seeing the threat to our coastline, to our houses, to our golf courses, and I want to try to explain to you my understanding, my vision, what I'm telling my golf club about what they need to do, about sea level rise and, and, and other things. So we're gonna split it up. It's a diff I've given so many talks in my career, this is one of the more difficult ones because I'm trying to cover two topics in depth, splitting the time in half, and so I don't wanna take any more time, but just so you know, if it's a little bit schizophrenic, it's on purpose, or it's Bob's fault. He asked me to do that. All right, so let's make sure we're all on the same page for the first half of the talk, red tides and green tides and such. If I just took some of the water from nearby here, the ocean water, put it under the microscope, this is what you might see. Many of these are little single-celled plants we call algae. You can see the gold balls here, there. They've got pigments that allow them to capture the sun's energy, photosynthesize, grow. That's the base of the marine food web. All of the fish, everything we've, we eat, originate, all of the carbon, all the protein, everything that's in them started at the base of the food web with these photosynthetic algae. 
this tens of thousands of species of algae in the ocean, and there's about a hundred of those that are really harmful. And many of those are toxic. They produce really nasty toxins. And that's what I work on and try to help society and countries all over the world figure out how to manage these. Perhaps to better understand what the way I view that little world is to look at this picture. Looks like a beautiful little spot, lots of flowers on hillsides. But a botanist looking at that would say there's all sorts of warfare going on in this idyllic little scene. Right at the edge between this species and this one, they're fighting for space. Who's going to get the sunlight? Who's going to get the energy and the, and the water in the soil? Some of these are making compounds, in fact, to inhibit the growth of the others. Some are making compounds that make them unpalatable to things that are going to eat them. And so there's all this chemical warfare going on as one species is coming down, one's rising. And that's the same thing that goes on in the ocean. So to try to understand some of the mechanisms that cause some of these red tides and so forth, first we have to understand how they grow. This is an individual cell, similar to your red tide species here in Florida, but not the same one. But it, when it grows, it grows a little bit and then it divides into two cells. So it doesn't really get bigger like a tree does, it becomes more numerous. One becomes two, two become four, four become eight, and when you get enough of them, you can actually change the color of the water, like you see here in, this, in Norway, this tiny little bloom, we call it. These are plants, so they, when they flourish, when they grow into large numbers, they can change the color of water. We call it a bloom. Here's a bigger one in the Potomac Estuary in the Chesapeake. You can see visible from the air a huge outbreak. And I could show you lots of other pictures. Some of these, as you'll see in a second, are visible from space. They can be that big. But there are so many different types of what we call harmful algal brooms. Down here in Florida, you talk about a red tide. And we sort of, scientists don't like to use that term because I can show you lots of blooms that are not red and are dangerous, lots of them that are red and are harmless, and some that are brown and green and so forth. So we use this term, hab, or harmful algal bloom. But we've given up, people in Florida call their red tide, red tide, so you'll hear me use that term, but in general, these are HABs, and you can see all of these different types, and I won't go through all of them, we're only going to talk about a few of these, but these first five are all associated with shellfish, could be crabs, could be oysters, clams, whatever, that it filter the water for food, like these mussels would filter the water, the algae, that's their food source, but if there's toxic algae there, they will, be, they will accumulate that toxin and it become, many of these can be lethal to humans. Certainly many of them will make you very sick. So those first five and then there's many, many others that are in that category. For those who may remember Francis Gary Powers, remember the U-2 pilot shot down over Russia years ago? He was carrying a little Actually, it wasn't a poison pill. It was actually a silver dollar coated with this paralytic shellfish poisoning toxin. That was how lethal it was. That was he never he never used it. He should have. We had to we explained we had to trade people for him. But he was supposed to have bitten the silver dollar or something, and and that was going to kill him. That's how poisonous these are. So, Florida red tide. Here is a good picture of it. You can see the nice water and then the the bloom that that's out here. You look closer to the shore and you can see, in this case, the water is discolored. All these dead fish and other animals are here because of a toxin that's produced by this little cell here called Karenia that's very fragile. It breaks open very easily. And when it breaks open, it releases toxin into the water that can not only kill these fish, but as you'll see in a second, can affect many of you through it becomes aerosolized. So first, look at the scale of the blooms typically. This is one bloom that lasted over a year along the west coast of Florida. From Tampa all the way down to the Keys, you can see how far offshore it went. Killed billions of fish, billions of them. 
hundreds of sea turtles, dolphins, just everything, all, all sorts of you know, sharks, you name it. Look at the size of these fish that were killed again by, by these toxins. That's a very common characteristic of the Florida red tides, but also it falls, it's one of those five poisoning syndromes because the shellfish down here are eating that Karenia, accumulating its toxin, and it, it, it's named neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Doesn't typically, isn't lethal typically, but it gets people very sick. So now you've got all these dead fish and dead animals. You've got poisonous shellfish. And here's what I meant. Here's this lifeguard wearing a mask. Most people, when the wind's blowing the right way and there's a red tide, walking along the beach are going to be wheezing and coughing. They get flu-like symptoms. They, their eyes water. That's because that toxin has gotten airborne into bubbles, sea spray, and it's coming inshore. You move a few blocks inland, you can be fine. But if you're asthmatic, if you have other respiratory issues, uh, you actually can have longer impacts just from breathing this aerosolized toxin. So it's got many different impacts. Here's the distribution of the Florida red tide. You can see that the this is since 1953. The predominant region is, again, Tampa down towards the Keys. You can see that there's some up here in the Panhandle. And also notice all along your coast here. So that happens when some of these blooms come around and go through the Keys. And then they come up, they start taking a ride with the Gulf Stream, and then they can affect your coast. But you can see it's not very frequent, much, much more frequent here. People don't really understand, honestly, after decades of research, how these blooms begin. There's still a lot of controversy about that. Some people believe that they start over in Mexico by the Yucatan, and they travel up in something called the loop current, and that they come down this way, and they can seed these coastal waters. Others, this is a paper that argues that there's a source region right here that, depending on the winds, can then cause the cells to come this way or that way, but when there's no good explanation for why it's a source region. What is it that's there? When are these cells during the winter time? Well, actually, during the summer time especially. This, this, these blooms typically happen August, September, October, November, December in that time frame. So the rest of the year, where are the cells? And that's why maybe they're in Mexico, maybe they're here, down in the sediment, down deep, but they're they're not along shore. But anyway, after a lot of years, I'm not sure what's happening here. After a lot of years, it's still, huh, you know what, Siri just heard me say, say something. <laughs> Good old Siri saying, I don't know what you're talking about. So um, anyway, we still don't understand the source of them. Another big unknown or a mystery actually concerns whether humans are making those red tides worse. These people here are all among many who believe that human pollution, in particular fertilizers and such from big agriculture, sugar farms, sugar plantain, whatever you call them here, big sugar, are entering your rivers and entering the coastal waters and fueling those blooms. And lots of studies have been done trying to see whether that's important or how important. And what I'm saying here is I think certainly Pollution from humans is a factor, but probably in the duration or the persistence of these blooms. These blooms can reach coastal waters and stay there for months and months and months. To do that with that kind of biomass, where there's all this red water with so many cells in it, you need, you need nutrients to keep it going. Normally in a bloom like that, it would be cycled. They'd have things dying and leaking nutrients into the water that would be regenerated and other cells would take that up. But it, it's much more likely that there is some input from, from land, from groundwater, from rivers that, that's playing a role. But it's not, it's not the only one. So now, now let's take a jump. We're going to go into fresh water, something that uh, you've probably seen around here. This is sort of your green tide. This is a, a, a picture of a real, real water not far from here. And what, we, what you're looking at is what we call cyanobacterial blooms, which are caused by blue-green algae. Now, they really aren't algae. They're, they're actually bacteria, but they are photosynthetic. So 
They're, they're called, they're called blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. This is a huge problem in freshwater throughout the U.S., as you see here. This is just one plot showing 2020, all of the places in the media where there were reports of, of either illnesses, pets dying, blooms, or whatever, in the media just around the country. So not every event that happened, but every one that ended up in the media somehow. And if I showed you a picture of this from 2010, there would be maybe one-tenth the dots there. And every year that number has gone up because the problem is getting worse. And I'll tell you in a bit why. So this is a major problem throughout Florida, the U.S. It's increasing everywhere. The impacts, again, this, these are toxin-producing organisms, dead fish, manatees, birds, other wildlife, property values. Imagine if you owned one of these properties and you've got this green slime outside every year. It happens and it's smelly and it's got dead things floating in it. It does terrible things to property values. And this one is one I really want to make sure you take home. This little, very happy little dog is about to jump into a toxic soup, right? I would never let my dog jump into something green like that or like this because many, many pets die when they're just swallowing water accidentally or whatever, drinking from it. Even on the edges of many of these blooms, the, the material dries up and gets all crispy. The dogs, for some reason, think it's tasty and they eat that and they die. So just be aware that, that this green tide issue can affect pets as well as humans. And down here, your problem really originates in, in along here as well as on the west in Lake Okeechobee. And notice you've got one outlet, the Caloosahatchee, one up here, the St. Lucie. And that lake is definitely affected by the fertilizers and such from the agriculture around there. Now here what we're seeing are satellite images. So a satellite looks down and has sensors that can pick up chlorophyll in the water. I said cyanobacteria are, are photosynthetic. They, they have chlorophyll in them, and that's what's being measured. So here at this date in June, nothing really in the, in the lake. Ten days, whatever, later, eight days later, you end up with some cells appearing, some bloom appearing. It's getting worse and much worse. Now, if that stayed in the lake, it would be one thing, but the Corps of Engineers has to release water, especially, and they're doing it right now. You've had all this rain. They have to, the level gets up high. They have to release it. Even if there's a huge bloom that started there, fueled by nutrients and so forth, it then enters those walkways, those, those pathways I showed you, and that's when you get these incredible green tides on your coast and on the west coast both ways, and there's lots of victims along the way, the homeowners and these poor manatees, and it originated there, unfortunately, in Lake Okeechobee. And right now, you've got another discharge. I'm not sure what's gonna happen, but, but be aware, you, you could see something like this again. Why are they occurring? Why are they getting worse? These particular species, cyanobacteria, like a lot of things that are happening as our world changes. This article by a colleague, a link exists between global warming and the worldwide proliferation of harmful cyanobacterial blooms. Why? Freshwater cyanobacteria grow faster than co-occurring algae at high temperatures. They just, just like in your garden, some species like it hot, some don't. These like it hot. They also like the fact that when the water gets hot, it stratifies more, it layers. You know how you can be swimming and it's all warm at the surface, you go down a little bit and it's cold, that's a stratified water column. They love it up in the surface and what they do is they shade everything that's below it. It's one of the reasons all the eelgrass that is dying in your, uh, the Indian River Lagoon system is because it's getting shaded by these kinds of blooms. And then there's more storms that are flushing nutrients from land and they, they love that kind of pollution. So speaking of the Indian River Lagoon, um, that's sort of another hot spot for, for these kind of problems. In fact, as you'll hear in a bit, I consider Florida to be maybe the poster child for HABs in the US. You know, we've got some problems up in the Northeast and there's some in the Northwest or California. You've got them all here. You've just virtually got them all. 
Um, and the Indian River Lagoon is a small version of that. Here's a brown tide. The water literally looks like coffee, milk and, you know, coffee with cream. It's, it's this, and interestingly, this is not a toxic organism. It's still a harmful one because it is shading everything underneath there, including all the eelgrass and so forth. And it also, as all of that biomass decays when the bloom gets older and gets sort of running out of nutrients, bacteria start consuming those cells. They use up oxygen. There's no oxygen in the bottom water. And a lot of things that live down the bottom die as well. And after this picture is taken, a few years later, the Indian River is green. Now we've got one of those cyanobacteria blooms. This is not the same species that was in Lake Okeechobee, but it was a different one causing its own impacts. And then up there, some of you may have heard of this beautiful blue bioluminescence that you can actually go and kayak through or even swim in. It's wonderful um, as a, just a, a phenomenon. But the organism that is bioluminescing there is the same, producing the same toxin as that one that was in Francis Gary Power's silver dollar. It's, it's the paralytic shellfish poison toxins, which are also then down here in the Indian River Lagoon. It's a species that likes warm water. I'm studying the same toxin way up in the Northeast where it's colder. That species doesn't live there, but another one does that makes the same exact toxin. And you've got th those three and more problems in the IRL. Okay, so let's talk about seaweeds now. They're also algae. They're not single-celled, they're, they're multicellular, they're large, they're visible. And I dearly wish I had time to tell you this story about the Chinese green tide where millions of tons of seaweed wash up on the beaches and it's linked to sushi. So those of you that like sushi and like the little dried algae that you wrap around the rice, you're responsible, it's your fault, okay? <laughs> and, I, and someone please ask a question and I'll tell you more, but I don't have time now. Here we are gonna talk about what directly affects you, which is sargassum. This seaweed that washes up on beaches in huge quantities. You see it's being removed here. Look at it here. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a massive problem, and, it's, and it does occur right here along your east coast. Here is just a picture and a quote that, that the city administrators basically estimate that to have daily removal of sargassum from this 15 miles of beach would cost about $45 million a year. That's just one little bit of the expense that sargassum is causing. But like many of these things that I'm describing you, it's a fairly new problem. Some of you that have been around a while probably don't, don't remember getting all these huge amounts of seaweed down in Miami and other places. Why, what's happening? Well, that's what you see here in this chart. And I'll show you in a second. In fact, let me just jump ahead. Well, I guess it's not in this presentation, but this will do. You can see that seaweed from space. It's so, such a huge, notice this one calls it the largest seaweed bloom on Earth. Stretches from Africa all the way into the Caribbean. And this is that 5,000 mile patch that you heard about in the news that was out in the Atlantic on its way towards Florida. And that was last year. But Here's the trend. You can see that all, since you can see it from space, we've had satellites up there a long time. You can go back and look, and there are no sargassum blooms in all this period of time in this region. And then all of a sudden, look at them getting worse and worse. So what happened? Why the sudden increase? Well, there's sort of three reasons for it, all of them related to, to climate and changing climate. One of the things that's happening in the ocean is that because it's warming, and that's the second half of this talk, a lot of the big currents are changing their behavior. I'll show you how the Gulf Stream is changing its behavior, affecting my region dramatically in a little bit. But one of the other changes is that you've all known that there's this area of the Sargasso Sea that's very, there's not a lot of currents, it, but it's got a lot of sargassum in it. And it's typically been contained by this sort of eddy feature but with the changing currents have actually allowed some of those, those sargassum to come along here, get caught in this current, the canary current, into the north equatorial current, and then it's now resident in the southern part of this region where it used to just be up here. So changing currents 
have introduced it into a region where it's persisting. What else is happening? Well, both in the Amazon and in the Congo, there's deforestation going on. So what's that doing? They're turning all that into farm. When forests are chopped down and burned, the nutrients in the soil are readily flushed out into the ocean. So you're, enter you're putting all these, these are plants. They're like your house plants. They need nitrogen, they need phosphorus. That's the kind of material that's coming out. And then not only that, we have a lot more flooding because of storms are more frequent. Where you used to have one storm every 20 years, now they're happening almost yearly. So you get heavy storms pumping out all this nutrient, and there's sargassum out there saying, thank you, I'm just going to grow, and I'm going to float, and I'm going to end up on the shores of parts of the US. So I know you're getting tired of all these negative things. You think, well, maybe I can go to a place where the water is clear, there's not a lot of algae in it, nice and safe, nothing to worry about. Sorry, I wish that were true, but this is something really important, especially I know some of you are avid fishermen, some of you go to the tropics a lot. If you don't know about ciguatera, you should. This is a ciguatera fish poisoning syndrome that's caused by, it, it occurs in tropical coral reef systems typically, but imported fish increasingly are moving all over the world. We've got reports of people in Germany and other places getting sick, eating grouper or something like that that was imported from far away. Mo this is the most frequently reported marine toxin disease in the world. 50,000 people a year, and it's probably more, get sick from eating fish like this. It doesn't kill you, but the symptoms are really bad. Honestly, when I go down to St. John, St. Thomas, I will not eat local fish unless I know absolutely where it came from, that it's a reputable hotel, um, and many times I'll eat cod or salmon or something like that because these symptoms can persist for months. You get sick, you can be sick for a long time, very severe neurological, uh, you switch your feeling hot and cold, get reversed, those kind of things. Uh, and sometimes they can come back years later, five years later. Um, I could tell you stories of a, a student in one of my classes who had gotten poisoned five years earlier and was sitting there in, in April and May with a ski jacket on because she was so cold. And it was a recurring thing that had happened from a poisoning years earlier. The reason it, how it happens is these are the same little types of golden plants. In this case, a species we call Gambier discus. It can swim but it chooses to live attached to seaweeds. Just like, it's an epiphyte, just like orchids can grow on trees. You know, they, they just use this as a surface, as a host. So in the ocean, the little herbivorous fish, the little rabbits of the ocean, come and eat that seaweed. This is a fat-soluble toxin. It's like DDT or PCBs. It biomagnifies, it moves. When this little herbivore is eaten by this carnivore, that picks up that toxin. When that carnivore is eaten by a bigger one, it becomes even more toxic. So the real dangerous fish are these big ones. So see this, this happy lady, this beautiful jack? You couldn't pay me to eat that fish. You couldn't pay me. Here's a poster from St. Bart's saying, never eat. Look at these different jacks. Here's the horse eye jack, the bar jack, the black jack. Look at the grouper, yellow fin grouper, red grouper. Here's the barracuda. Never eat a big, big barracuda. I don't care where you are. They are usually highly toxic. And then these are very risky, and these are moderately risky. So just be aware. You go down to the tropics. Be careful. At least be, know that this, this exists. So normally, in a talk like this, I would say, OK, enough of that. Let's talk about what we're doing about this. What are the what's the scientific community doing to monitor and to manage and even control these blooms? And I could spend time talking about that. I could tell you about m modeling and forecasting that we're doing, running computer models to, to simulate and forecast these, these blooms like this one up in the Northeast, about new sensors like this one that can detect cells, measure the toxins, do all this robotically in the ocean and, and give you data 24-7. We have autonomous vehicles that we can put these instruments on and they can cruise around the ocean taking measurements and going to where these events are happening and telling us uh, about it. And then we even have control strategies like you see us here spraying material into a little canal trying to control the red tide. But 
that's another talk for an, another day. What I want to do to try to help us spring to the second half of this is to just make sure you realize how warming temperatures are a major factor in HABs worldwide. And I'm gonna give you two examples from my own work, direct work. I'm doing work in Florida, but not in this context. Here's a, a story showing ocean temperatures are off the charts. This has been an extremely warm year. 2023 was the warmest year in history. And those of you that say, well, yeah, it was warm someplace, but it was cold somewhere else, it all balances out. It doesn't. You can look at this map, and you can see the, the darker the colors. The, what this map shows is a temperature anomaly. 50 years worth of records of surface, sea surface temperature from satellites that are really accurate. You can get an average. And so at this point in time, over 50 years, there's an average temperature. And right then in 2023, this was July or something like that, you can see these areas that are all this color, 15 degrees warmer, 15 Fahrenheit degrees warmer there in the North Atlantic. If you look all over the ocean, you can see other areas that were really warm. And if you say, well, where was it colder? It's just a little bit here and a little bit there. You integrate that over the whole world, and you get a much, much warmer ocean. No doubt about it, no question about it. So warming temperatures are really large. And what, well, what is it doing to some of the species I work on? Remember, I'm studying a lot of them up here in the Gulf of Maine. Here, you know, here's Massachusetts, Nova Scotia. And for years, we've known that the oceanography of this region is basically a battle between the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current. These two huge currents are battling it out. And historically, the Labrador Current, which is bringing down cold and, and a little bit fresher water, is able to come around Newfoundland, come down here by the St. Lawrence, and come into the Gulf of Maine, bringing cool waters. But that's changing. The Gulf of Maine is now, other than the Arctic, the fastest warming region compared to the, the, the whole globe. Why? It's because this normal battle, which the Labrador Current was winning for the longest time, it's now losing. The Gulf Stream is stronger, it's heading north much more, and now when you get this sort of collision, right now near the Grand Banks, the Gulf Stream is stronger. And what that means is this cold water isn't coming in. Instead, we're getting all this warm water into the Gulf of Maine. It's why it's warming up. We're getting, think about our lobsters, our cod, our version of the red tide are all being affected dramatically. And in this case, being affected in a way that's good, here's the, le the toxicity detected in the state of Maine, that PSP toxicity, and you can see it's been going down year after year after year. And one of the reasons we believe this is happening is that battle that the Gulf Stream is winning and we're getting this warmer water. So in this case, the problem is going away, it's moving north. Well, here's an example of where it's moving north. Take that same map, look here, here's Alaska, Russia, here's Bering Strait. Notice up north of Bering Strait in the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea, you can see this, again, 10 degrees or more warmer and just the other year, 2022, we were running research cruises up here. We basically documented the largest, most toxic bloom ever observed nationwide. Here, moving up through into this region where there's all these indigenous communities who had no idea how to deal with this. It hasn't happened before. They have no social customs of when to eat shellfish, when to eat other things, when not to. They also eat everything in the ocean. They, they eat sea stars, they eat tunicates, they eat things you think are all awful, but that's their subsistence harvesters. They don't go to the grocery stores to eat. They, they live off the ocean. And now we've got, because it's warming, these toxic species moving up there. It's, it's truly depressing and, and, and worrisome. Okay, so as I said, I'm a, I'm a golfer, I'm a coastal resident. I'm aware the ocean is changing dramatically. This is the course that I play at uh, up in Massachusetts called Catanzit. It's a beautiful seaside course. And for years, knowing things were happening, I kept trying to convince 
Our Board of Governors, we had to worry about this, and they just wouldn't listen. I don't believe the ocean's getting warmer. I don't believe sea, well, sea level is, is going up. But finally, we had an enlightened Greens chairman who said, okay, Don, talk to us. But part of the reason he was willing to is because he was already seeing signs of what's happening. Here's our iconic third hole. It's our version of an island green surrounded by sand. It's a beautiful hole. This was that hole just a few months ago with a king tide. King tide is one of the highest tides. You've had them here. You get a few every year, typically in the fall. It's, it's a couple feet, maybe higher. That's a sign. That is your signal of what things are going to be like 20 or 30 years from now. Twice a day. Not once or twice a year, but twice a day. And so when our, you can't even get to the third hole with a big king tide, okay, things, things are bad. So what are we doing? We, in order for us to have our task force try to figure out what to do, you have to look ahead. You have to say, well, how, what is the trajectory of the warming and the sea level rise? How do you do that? Well, unfortunately, you have to think, what is society going to do about this? What, you, you know there was a big UN conference for the climate. All these countries met, tried to come up with policies. They failed. They failed year after year. The only thing they agreed on this time was, let's give money to Bangladesh and islands in the Pacific that are flooding because those problems, they didn't create them. But there's not really been a policy. But if they've called these things representative con concentration pathways, so if we do nothing, this is business as usual. So you still have coal fire power plants, you still have gasoline vehicles. Way down here, this RCP is lots of renewable energy, lots of bicycles, public transport, electric vehicles, and huge differences in the amount of, of carbon going into the atmosphere, huge differences in the temperature increases and in sea level that you're gonna see depending on those scenarios. So as a club, us, you, Seminole, which of these scenarios are we gonna use? Unfortunately, we have to use this one because nobody's changing anything. Society is not doing anything, so let's just, and that makes life easier for us to project because we know what the past has been and we can see what the future is going to be. It, it gets a lot harder to model these, but this is the one we have to use. So remember that. So what causes sea level to rise? There's really three major factors. One is called just thermal expansion of the water as it warms. It's a great little experiment to do with kids or grandkids. Take a container, put it on the stove, carefully measure where the water level is, measure the temperature, heat it up, there's going to be a higher elevation of water in that container because when water warms, it becomes bigger in volume. That's what's happening in the world ocean. So anyone who says, oh, but it's high, you know, your sea level's rising here, but it's dropping over there. That may be happening because of these current changes that are going on, but we are just basically having a more a larger volume of water in the ocean and it can do nothing but seek a level everywhere. So that's 50% of the increase we've seen over the last 100 years. It's just been because the ocean's warmer. We also are melting mountain glaciers. Here's a picture I took up in Greenland along the coast way up here on a cruise. You can see this little tiny little glacier. You can see what it used to be. This valley used to be filled with the glacier, and it's, it's, you've heard it all, these glaciers are retreating, melting, and that's 25% of the, of the water that's entering the ocean. And then Greenland is just a huge, deep ice, chunk of ice, basically. If all of the ice in the top of Greenland melted, sea level would rise about 15 feet, feet. If Antarctica, which is the same thing, melts, that's another 30 or 40 feet. So, but that's gonna take a long time. But you see this red shows you where Greenland is actually melting, and that's another 25%. So those, that's all happening. So why is it happening? Well, the atmosphere is getting warmer. I'll show you the ocean's getting warmer too, and many of these glaciers and such are melting from underneath as well as on, on the surface. Here's Massachusetts temperature trend going back to the 1850s or so. You can see this rather steady increase. If you think, oh, that's Massachusetts, 
Here's Fort Myers, very much the same trend. 2.9 degrees, it's warmer since 1902. And notice also in recent years how, how steep that increase is. So there's no question that, that the atmosphere is warming. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, we've had these cycles in the past. We've had glacial, we've had a little ice age, we've had times when it's been warm and cold. We just have to, it's all natural, this heating. I, I will disagree, I, I, and I'll show you why. These are the kind of cycles that we're talking about there. Here's the present time. This is an ice core from Antarctica, and they can date it, and they can figure out just what the temperatures in the ocean were at different times, or the temperatures in the atmosphere. So you can see where we are now, and you can see then, here's, notice this is 80, 100,000 years. This is almost a, a million years going back here. You can see we're warm. This was the little ice age, then it was warm, then the little ice age. You can see that happening. It's not a perfect synchrony. And notice there's CO2 up here. And I am not telling you that CO2 is making this happen. It's actually often viewed the other way. And I won't go into why, but when it's warm, when it's cold, CO2 can, can increase in the atmosphere. What's important, though, is that there is this cycles, and we understand why they happen. They're called Milankovitch cycles, after the guy who, who discovered this. And what, they're, what they are, here's the sun, and the Earth is rotating around the sun. And it doesn't rotate in a perfect circle. It's an ellipse. Sometimes it's close to the sun, sometimes it's far away. That happens over a time frame between 100,000 years and 400,000 years to, to make this difference. Here's, well, this is one. The Earth also tilts. Sometimes the Earth is leaning towards the sun, sometimes it's leaning away. That also changes how much radiation we have. And then other times it wobbles. So, you, and this one has a 20,000 year cycle, this one has 40,000 years. So, what does this all mean? They, these Milankovitch cycles operate on really long time scales, ranging from tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And yet, the warming I'm showing you is taking place over time scales of centuries maybe, decades to centuries. So we, you know, there's it, and then even more important, NASA now says that over the last 40 years, solar radiation has actually decreased. In other words, we are in a cooling part of the cycle. We should be getting colder, and we're not. Our temperatures are going up like I showed you. So you can't explain our cycles, I mean, our warming on the base of these long time series. Other things are going on, but I'm not gonna try to say what those things are. I'm just gonna say it, that it's not the fact that the Earth is di further or closer to the sun. Here's the air, I just showed you that temperature. What's the ocean doing? Same thing. The ocean absorbs 80% of the heat added to our climate system. If we didn't have an ocean, we'd be frying right now because uh, there's so much volume, it takes a lot to heat up the ocean. And that gives you that 50% sea level rise increase. So how fast is sea level rising? I mean, those of you that have houses or the beach club or the golf course, you wonder, well, how, what is the number that we should be worried about? If we look over here, over roughly 100 years, and run a straight line through it, you get roughly a foot per, year, per 100 years. Doesn't sound too bad, it's still a lot. A foot, you know, depending on where you are with your property and such. But it, it actually is not correct to run a straight, a simple linear extrapolation, running a straight line through that, because if you look more recently, what you see is this. Here's sea level rise, basically, in time. Notice this interval, 1900 to 1930, this is the, the rate. 1930 to 1992, it more than doubles. 1993 to 2017, it doubles again. This is an acceleration. It's not a straight line, which would be a velocity, right? It's an acceleration, and that is the extrapolation we have to think we, we can work with if we wonder what's happening in the next 15, 20, 30 years. Luckily, the whole lot of my colleagues that really work on, on sea level rise published a, a big report giving you sea level rise scenarios for the US on the regional basis. And here are the key messages. 
And the, this first one says that by 2050, they are now much more confident in the estimates of sea level rise than they were just some years ago. And the reason is because multiple lines of evidence, and I'll say what that means in a second, are providing, they're converging, they're giving us the same numbers. And notice that that's happening regardless of that emission pathway, regardless of the RCP you choose. Why is that? Because we're only talking 25 years. There's nothing that society can do in 25 years that's gonna slow down this aircraft carrier that's got so much momentum built up in the heat, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, there's nothing we're gonna do. You could, tomorrow, I could snap my fingers and say we're all carbon neutral the whole world, which isn't gonna happen, but if we did, we still continue to heat up. Things still melt for 30 or 40 years. And then what happens? It levels off. Well, that sounds like a good thing. No, because it's leveling off at a high temperature. What we really need to do is start removing a lot of that carbon from the atmosphere. And that's one of the things my institution is working hard on. How do we sequester a lot of carbon in the ocean? Because we actually have to reduce what's in the atmosphere, not just get to a level. But anyway, so the trajectories are being assessed by extrapolating, so st taking the curves I showed you, both the rates, of the straight lines, and the accelerations estimated from what? Tide gauges, satellite observations, which I said are very, very accurate, but they only go back you know, 30, 40 years, and then model projections. If you don't trust numerical models, all three of these are giving the same results. They all fall within the same range by 2050. And the conclusion is that sea level along the U.S. coastline will rise as much in the next 30 years as it did in the last 100 years. That's that acceleration we're talking about. And roughly 1.3 feet is the number. Well, it doesn't, again, sound like a lot, but here, here are some of the figures from that report. I blew up the southeast for you. The black line are the tide gauges. You can see that's that rising. The blue, you can see the satellite started around here. You can see it agreeing very well in terms of sea level height. And then if you extrapolate, and depending on these different scenarios, you can get, you can see 1.3 feet is roughly there. And it could be 50% of the time it could be higher, 50% of the time it could be lower. Um, that, but that's, that's a number for us all to work with. So I, and you could do this too, you can just go out and look for some of these sea level rise viewers. These are some of the links. You just Google sea level rise viewer and you get something like this where it's very easy to put in your community. This is Marion where I live and you can see I put in 1.3 feet here and you can see in red the parts of the town that are expected to be underwater if the sea level goes up by 1.3 feet. And you can even get down to individual streets and and even bits of property. I've had a lot of friends and colleagues say, will you do this? I wanna buy this house, or maybe I should sell my house. And, and it's, it's easy to do. So I did that for the club. I showed them what, in this case, this is three feet, what that's gonna do. Then I got their attention. And so we now have launched a real study. Very much, I mean, I, obviously I'm an MIT person, nerdy, whatever. We did it right. We, we went and flew drones and got very high resolution terrain mapping. We need, you need to know exactly how high every bit of land is because you want to know where the water's coming from. What I just showed you here is where it will be, but this doesn't say anything about how it got there, right? So to figure that out, to learn the pathways, we need this, this drone mapping of the altimetry. We then need a modeling study to see, again, these pathways. And then we have to look, once we get that, how are we going to do something about it? Do we just abandon, retreat, say we give up? We have to go buy some land elsewhere, extend the course inland a little bit? Do we build dikes? A lot of engineering has gone into this. Are we raising fairways? And one of the things we're doing, because we have people that aren't convinced that this is really serious, that we're doing something called hold the line. And I'll tell you what that means, because it's important if people here try to do something like this. And this is a complicated slide. All I want to say is that if you run the models that we did, you can see for 2050, this number for elevation is 2.6 feet. Why isn't it 1.3? The difference is this is 
like 99% probability that sea level will never go above that point. What I told you before is that 50% of the time it could be higher or lower. So this is like designing to a 100 year flood rather than a flood that happens every few years. So it adds another foot or two. So this is the number, 2.6 feet that we are using to design to here in 2050, 2.5, 2.6 feet. And I told you we went through all of these. I don't have the time to go through each one, but I do want to tell you about something you have to be very concerned about as a, as a landowner, as an association, uh, as a golf course. The Corps of Engineers has regulatory jurisdiction over the U.S. waters. What does that mean? They mean they, if you are seaward of their jurisdictional line, which is called the annual high tide line, you can't work there. You can't do anything. What's the annual high tide line? It's not the same thing as your average high tide. It is the highest predicted tide of the year. Think king tide. Think of the biggest tide you've seen. Forget storms and, and you know, storm surge, just a regular tide that is really high. That's a good idea of exactly where the jurisdiction ends. And that's quite a bit higher than mean high water. You can see it's over here. And so what does that mean? If you look at some of the engineering diagrams we've produced, here's our second hole that goes this way, the 17th hole comes this way. This is a low area in between. This is sort of a valley in here. This blue line is that annual high tide line. So right now, we can't do anything in here. We can't fill it. We're just not allowed to do anything. But you know what? That line isn't just going to be there 10 years from now. It's moving. It's moving this way. It's moving this way. It's moving this way because sea level is rising. So what we're doing to give us time to raise money, to give us time to convince people who aren't convinced yet, we're holding the line. We're doing things that are going to keep this line from moving. And that I won't go into details of how we're doing it. You can see them all here. We're actually raising some cart paths. We're doing some aggressive top dressing and repairing berms and so forth. But this is giving us time. And when, in maybe 10 years or, or so or less, we, we really see that something's happening. What we have here, you can see phase two, where we have to raise, this is one fairway. If we want to do the 2030 level, we go to here. 2050, we go here. 2070, out here. This, and we've got all the cost estimates to say how we can do it. All right, well, does this look familiar? This is your golf course. I ran that same little simulation. And the truth is, you're in pretty good shape here. Now, I don't know where all of you live. Some of the homeowners definitely aren't on these maps, as you'll see. But the golf course is actually quite high. I did this same thing at Jupiter Island. I gave a talk there, and, you'll, and they they go underwater a couple feet before you do. <laughs> I hope that feels good, okay? <laughs> so watch what happens. So this is that same viewer. This is mean high water right now. Here's one foot. And it's hard to see, but there's really nothing much going on. What these green areas are, are areas that are below sea level, but you can't get any water to them this, at this point. So they're just showing you this is below that sea level, right? But it's, it's isolated because it's higher here and higher here. That's one foot. Here's two feet. And you know if you look closely, see this little blue? That's where there is some loss, or these properties here. But still, the golf course itself looks OK. Three feet, a little more here. It's still pretty good. Look up there, you're losing something. Um, around here, but it's, it's still pretty high. Four feet, all of a sudden you can see these roads are underwater. Some of these properties are getting wetter. The golf course has much more property that is potentially below sea level. Let's look at five feet. There it is. There's, there's, there's your magic number that you'd have to worry about. Once that happens, your course is, is, is in bad shape, and a lot of properties are as well. 
and we were just talking about this earlier, it's real obvious to me that this water is not coming this way. It's coming this way. It's coming from your west, right? And this is what you worry about. So I want to make sure you realize that everything I've said is just about sea level twice a day, right? High tides, not storms. Storms add something over and above that. And unfortunately, as you probably all have experienced, the storms are getting more powerful. They get a lot more rain. They're a lot windier. This is written by a colleague and a really wonderful Scientific American article. I'll read it. Every year it becomes clear that today's epidemic of bizarre weather cannot be explained by natural variability. In the past, scientists were careful to not directly link climate change to specific weather events. We are now indeed saying that because of climate change, major flooding is occurring more often, killer heat waves are hotter and lasting longer, cold spells are sticking around longer. I could tell you we're having more atmospheric rivers on the west coast, we're having droughts and fires in Canada. This is all happening and scientists are no longer just saying, oh, it's just natural variability. It's happening and for you, I'll give you one clear example of how this is, is affecting you. Remember this map? Here's Florida. Waters around Florida have reached distressing levels. We all heard about this amazing 100 degree, that's hot tub temperatures in your ocean someplace south of Miami. And you can see how much warmer things are in general compared to that 50 year record. Why does that matter? Well, in one particular case, let's look at hurricanes. It is an established fact, inarguable basically, that hurricane wind speed for every two degree increase in the water temperature underneath, you've all heard about it, in the Caribbean and, and off of Florida, if the water increases by two degrees, the wind speed increases by 11 miles an hour. That's a lot. The difference between a category five and a category, category four is like 15 miles an hour. So you get much more destructive, much, much, more, much stronger storms down here. Not only that, some of these storms are gonna make it up my way where normally they run out of steam, but they're starting out much stronger. And this just came out recently. Look at this figure. It shows you the, the different wind speeds here of all of these North Atlantic hurricanes since 1983. Well, that slope, if this were a stock, I'd be buying it because it's, it's going up. But what it's saying is that your storms are getting more powerful. I'm not saying you're getting more of them. Just the ones that you're getting are more powerful. So that's yet another thing you need to start adding into the equation of, okay, sea levels, foot, two feet higher. Here comes more storms, that a storm surge, it's gonna make that even worse. So I'm, I'm sorry, but that's, that's the story. <laughs> Doom and gloom, uh, it is, it's on both fronts. Um, I'm happy to, to take questions, but I want you to realize that, that the times are changing. And we are trying as scientists to do what we can, but as a society, we also have to do a lot. And um, I just, uh, people have to be aware that, that this is real, that the, the, the warming ocean and the rising tides and the red tides and so forth are serious and we have to worry about them. So thank you very much. I think we have to use, where's the microphone, Bob? Do you have it? Yes, just push it forward. I guess this is being streamed or something, so they can't hear you unless. <laughs> Phone number. Uh, Martha McDade, uh, chair of the Architectural Review Committee for the POA here at Law Street. And that, thank you, Don, that was one of the most complete and clear, understandable presentations of climate change that I've heard in a long time. Um, I have done a lot of work on dams and hydraulic structures, and what first impressed me, besides the Antarctic or the, um, the ice cores that you talked about, was that I was at a conference in Canada, and the mining engineers, who are among the dirtiest, most, most polluting characters on the planet when it comes to um, <coughs> environmental contamination because of the tailing ponds that they produce in mining. They were talking about how worried they were about climate change. And it really got my attention because what happened in Canada and the Northwest Territories in the Yukon 
was that they were keying in the dams that contained these tailing ponds with, um, into the permafrost. And what was happening was the permafrost was melting. So they were having these disasters with tailing ponds right. overflowing and, and basically contaminating a wide area because they were no longer able to hold into the permafrost. And so same kind of, that's what you're saying about yes. how, and this was probably 10, 15 years ago when I heard this and I thought, holy cow, if they could only make this presentation in the US, you'd have a few more people convinced that this was actually happening. But you showed very clearly that the change is so much bigger in that part of the world, in Canada, yes. in Alaska, that, et cetera. So um, that's what really uh, jolted me awake. And a number of the people in the audience went home just astounded. So this, too, I think was astounding. But I, I don't want anyone here to lose sleep about Lost Tree tonight, not, maybe not tonight, maybe in a couple of years, but we have hired a consultant here to do exactly what Don was talking about for his course. Um, and this is gonna be a collaborative effort between the POA and the club. And we have um, this week, in fact, hired a consultant that's going to use exactly the same kind of LIDAR imaging that Don talked about, very accurate to within a couple of inches to map the entire Lost Tree community and we're going to run some simulations in a model that will determine for various storm events, 2040, 2070, et cetera, where our biggest vulnerabilities are. Is it coming from the ocean? Is it coming from intercoastal? Probably intercoastal, as Don just described. We should have just talked to you six months ago. Could have saved us some time. We would have been free. But we now know that. We did, a, we did a flood inundation study already, a paper study, and now we're proceeding to the next phase, which will be the more detailed stormwater modeling um, that we need to do to, to figure out where we need to build up our resilience. And, and just remember what I said about the Corps of Engineers, because at, at Jupiter Island, while I was playing, part of the incentive to come down here and talk was I got to play golf, and I got to play today, it was wonderful, and I got to see these courses that I've been simulating and so forth. At Jupiter Island, that, as we were going around, my host there kept saying, well, when the last king tide we had in October, this whole area here was underwater. And, you know, he's saying it sort of matter-of-factly, like, well, we can deal with it. And I'm saying, well, you are defining a high tide line where you cannot work anymore. You know, those cart paths, that T, you may not be able to get to that T, because you can say, I want to raise this by a foot. Corps of Engineers say, no, no, we own that. That's our jurisdiction. So when we say hold the line, we're saying when you get your plans and everything, find that line and then make sure that if it takes you five years to get things done, that you focus on making sure that, that you don't find yourself on the wrong side of the line for some of the changes you want. That's good advice. We have not um, proceeded to the permitting stage at that. That's where be, you will run into it, exactly. That's where, um, but at the end of this effort in September, October, we will be addressing permit barriers for all of the um, resiliency efforts that we want to impose. And some of these are going to be on the golf course. Some may be seawall rays. We, we're not sure what the list of options is going to be yet, but the plan is to develop a list of um, options and then prioritize them based on cost, time to permit, feasibility, acceptance by the community, etc. So we're on it. <laughs> I don't want anybody to be uh, you know, concerned. Of course, we should all be concerned. I'm glad you're all here and hearing this directly, but um, we're doing the same kind of work that Don is doing. And Young Kim is on the committee, as is um, George Estes and Laura Estes, who are here. And Bob Callahan is very aware of what's been going on. So a lot of folks in the community are very involved in this issue. So thank you very well, much. That's good. Thank you for putting a positive spin on all the n all of the negativity that I that, that I that I that I threw at you. And um, yeah, I I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And and I think you're, um, you're you're doing all of the right things. What what I would just say to people, uh, how a lot of people are thinking this isn't going to happen in my lifetime. I don't really have to worry about this. And it's, it's really not true. Things are accelerating, things are happening, and we need, to, we, we need to act now. I'm not totally pleased with our hold the line plan because it's gonna cost us five, six, seven years. Um, but it's the pragmatic view of how we can deal with our membership and the fundraising and, and so forth. But anyway, th this, this is not something that's happening 50 or 100 years from now. It's, 
it's here and, and you're seeing it. So. Don, thank you for being one more question. Right, one more. Go ahead, Billy. Yeah. Uh, Bill Harrison, just first of all, great presentation. But I have a very practical question. It was very concerning what you said about the fish we might eat. So <laughs> what would you advise? You know, you have swordfish, tuna, salmon, grouper, whatever that we eat all the time. So what do you recommend we not eat? <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. Um, I'll even extend that to shellfish. Um, down here, you don't worry so much about it, but up most of the rest of the country, you do. This country has a wonderful monitoring program, very effective for all of those different toxic toxin syndromes in shellfish. And so, you can safely eat shellfish that you buy from a reputable dealer, or you can even go out and dig them yourself if you know. You look at your state's website and learn that the areas are, are open. If they're dangerous, they close them down. You go to another country, then I start to worry. In Europe, I will eat shellfish. In China, the Philippines, other places, I do not trust their monitoring programs. I do, um, if someone's hosting a dinner and they put you a big plate of little clams there, I do everything possible without offending them to not eat those because I don't trust their system. So shellfish, Pretty easy, go with the developed countries and, and you're, you're good. Fish, um, all the ones you mentioned, salmon, swordfish, tuna are pelagic fish. Tuna you worry about and swordfish you worry about with mercury accumulation, but, but by and large, none of the toxins I worry about are gonna be in those kind of fish. It's the coral reef type fish that I would say to be careful with. And there, um, again, avoid the big predators that hang out near the coral. So mahi-mahi, for example, perfectly fine to eat those. But, you know, something like a, like a barracuda or the jacks I showed you, and, and not all grouper are dangerous. That, I can't really tell you the names now, but depends on what they eat. Some of them do not eat the part of the food chain that collects that toxin. So, but honestly, most of the time when I, Someone says it's grouper, I try to find out where it's from. And if it's from the Caribbean or something like that, I'm not going to take the chance. But nowadays they're farming a lot of grouper, so it may be that that's what you're, you're eating. So there, it's just, I mean, if you want, I could send you a list of the, the species that are commonly toxic, and that would help you. But that's, if you know where they're living and feeding, that, that's a good, a good start. But basically this also goes, not just the tropics, but mostly tropical islands. We don't understand why that is. But it's, for example, St. Thomas, St. John's, all of that. Here in Florida, it's only really the Keys where you have the issue so far. Mm. Hawaii, Fiji, you know, but not, for example, the Latin America along the coastline. I, we don't get it, but so islands, tropical islands. And the final thing, I know nobody asked, but you know those whirling fish you've all Mm -hmm. been reading about. Mm -hmm. People wonder, and I've got colleagues who have just been on several calls this week, who are looking at one possible explanation being that ciguatera poison being the cause. And it's, it's a real mystery. People have been looking for a long time now, for a month, two months, at PCB, you know, just organic contaminants, you know, was there oil spill, was there sewage, was there something else, and finding nothing. And my colleagues that really do the chemistry on this have been looking and finding and not finding the exact ciguatoxin that causes that fish poisoning. But they are finding some precursors and some other molecules that those algae produce. And in fact, they're, they're finding them in certain tissues of the fish, like the gills, at really high concentrations. So it could be, may not be a neuro, it looks like there's a neurotoxin may not have anything to do with algae. It may be something else. But people are getting a little closer to explaining it. But right now, the best scientists in the world are stumped as to what's happening down in the Keys. So I wish you had a better answer, but it's, it, it's, that's what we know. Don, thank you so much. This is really a, a learning experience. I, I wish I were... And we're unable to go to dinner with you tonight. There's a group going to dinner with you, and I, I, I cannot, I'd love to be there to watch them w wait for you to m order your fish. <laughs>
before they order. You've got it. I so whoever's going, that. yeah, whoever's going, report back what he orders. Okay, it's just really interesting. So, yeah, I am one of those people who will say, <laughs> "You're not going to eat that, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much, Bob Stegman, for having him here. Thanks, folks. Goodbye. Yeah.